Oh, please turn your cell phones off. chairs, a metal waste, waste basket, and a shelf of supplies, including a pair of scissors. 3.20 p.m. after school. Spencer enters. Beth wears a cardigan letterman sweater with the bait team across the back over a long sleeve blouse. Spencer wears a letterman's jacket. Beth is arranging three chairs around the table, pushing the others to the side. We'll have Jane sit down at the far end of the table. I'll be down here by the door. <laughs> In case she tries to kill you. Spencer taking his letterman jacket off. Uh, leave your coat on and button it up. Spencer puts his coat back on, though he doesn't button it. In case she tries to stab me. Spencer, have you read her blog? And for God's sake, don't call her Cutter Jane. That's who she is. That's what she does. Have you read her blog? If she wants to cut herself, fine. Doesn't hurt me, but... Have you read her blog? She calls it In Praise of Black Trench Coats. We aren't here to talk about cutting. Got it. Let Cutter Jane take razor blades to her arms, but for goodness sake, don't write anything that might interfere with Beth's ability to concentrate on her studies. It's not about me. It's about the school. It's about safety. Why am I here? I'm not on the student council. Why me? Well, you aren't like the others. You seem to float above it all. You're too distracted to be mean. Well, in your own way, you are conceited. You know you're smart, you're definitely privileged, but you aren't mean. So of all the jerks you know, <laughs> I, I'm the least likely to trigger Cutter Jane into a killing spree as we sit and talk today. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what right have you even got to talk to her? Why you? I had a dream. <laughs> getting, about getting into Harvard? It was about Jane. It was this very intense Dream. It sounds like simple anxiety. I don't think you need me here. Spencer, I need you to be here. I'm supposed to be Mr. Nice, but the truth is that I detest what she does. I'm cutting her own arms up. I, I hate self-destructive behavior. The meeting isn't about cutting. Sorry, I I'd be a hypocrite. I can't do it. I'm out of here. She's coming, remember. Jane sits down here and button up that coat. The door opens and Cutter Jane walks in wearing a long black trench coat. She closes the door behind her. Hi, Jane. Would you like to sit down here? Cutter Jane ignores Beth and sits where she is, at the table and nearest the door. Beth sits at the far end. Spencer sits between them. He looks at Cutter Jane and buttons up his jacket. <laughs> <laughs> First time I've ever been invited to the student council office. Now I can die and go to heaven. Well, it's actually a storeroom. We carved out a place here to work on projects. Cutter Jane stands, walks over the light switch next to the door. Three students locked in a storeroom after school. Sounds like a slasher flick. She flips off the lights. <clears throat> Beth screams for bloody murder. Cutter Jane flips the light back on, <laughs> returns to her seat by the door. That is so not funny. Believe it or not, we're here to help. Beth is worried about your new website in praise of black trench coats. Someone knocks on the door. Spencer jumps up, opens the door, and speaks to a person unseen. Uh, everything's fine. We're just practicing a play. We asked Beth to imagine she'd gotten her first B. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help. I'm giving you 40 minutes, nearly an hour of my time. At 4 o'clock, I've got a study group, and I have another commitment at 6. What we are doing here isn't an official meeting. We just want to reach out. The vice principal says you haven't directly threatened anyone yet, but he's watching your site closely, and so are the police. Who's watching the jerks like you and Spencer? 
The penny never drops for you people. You're glorifying killers. It's more of a critique. Critique? Are you reviewing these murderers on uh, style or body count or what? Mainly on their targeting. Totally pathetic. You want them to become better shots? I can't believe this. Can't you just be happy carving up your own arms? I didn't say better shots, just more discerning in whom they take out. I'm going to be sick. Not as sick as Cutter Jane. <laughs> You're the ones who invited me here to your little do-gooder inquisition. And by the way, I'm not talking about the psychopaths. I purposely left them off my side. I'm talking about kids who pick up guns after they've been bullied across a line no one should ever have to see. And you two alleged young scholars are too uptight, too frightened, too pathetically wrapped up in your own Ivy League lives to listen. Go back to cutting up your own arms and hiding the scars with your black trench coat. Spencer, stop it. We aren't here to talk about cutting. That's right. Silly me. The subject was shotguns. You are a self-righteous brat, Spencer. But you can't help that. Growing up on an only child? Good God! With two physicians for parents? So much money, so much attention, and only one little brat to shower it on. Thank you, Cutter Jane. And about your obsession with my cutting, number one, go to hell. Number two, <laughs> I want to stop doing it. I'd love to stop doing it. Well, that should be pretty damn easy, just stop doing it. Spencer, everyone talks about how smart you are, but you aren't smart enough to understand what I'm going to say. Ready? I can't just stop doing it, because you won't let me. Were you able to parse that? <laughs> That's right. Poor, misunderstood Cutter Jane. Everyone is so mean to you. You said it, but you get it. You're serious. I knew you couldn't get it. Yes, Spencer. I'd love to stop cutting, but people like you and Beth and Marigold and this aimless herd of other mean girls and arrogant boys just won't let me. Don't blame me. Right. There must be some other reason. Let's see. Do you want to hear that my father beat me? Guess what? He was gone before I was born. Do you want to hear that my mother is an alcoholic? Guess what? She's not. She works harder than all your parents put together. So why do I come? <coughs> because of you, Beth. And all of your mindlessly mean friends who so effortlessly manage to make it hell on earth for anyone who might be just a little bit different. For those who you see are, as not sufficiently cool, or connected, or whatever other criteria you might be using this week. I've never been mean to you. Then why the dream? It's not That's why we're here. No, it's not, Spencer. Let me guess. Beth had a dream that she forgot all about her physics final. <laughs> I, I said dream. That, that would be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it was about a shotgun here at school. Probably because by my website that you and your friends find so terrifying. Probably caused by my website that you and your friends find so terrifying. If you'd actually read it, it's just a place where you can find out about school shootings. I've researched just about all of them going back ten years. That is a very weird thing to study. The newspaper coverage is always the same. Day one, horrible news. Day two, let's see how many bouquets and teddy bears we can dump on the site. Day three, heroic kids and teachers with the grief counselors will carry on to a bright new day. And maybe on day four, oops, there may have been bullying involved. End of story. But the real stories come out afterwards, and they aren't in the papers. You've got to search, but you find out where the uncool kids from that school are gathering online, and you usually find out two things. Someone made life hell for the shooter, and number two, he shot the wrong people. What do you mean, wrong people? You've got to look deep to find this, but at some point, the shooter's classmates actually start listing who should have been shot. Not vindictively, not threateningly. They're just like, dude, if you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison, at least take out the right assholes along the way. <laughs> That's like my dream. Miss Cardigan's sweater here penciled us in for the nearly an hour of her precious time just so she could talk to us about her dream. I call it the pump shotgun test. That's what it was like. It figures you dream about taking a test. The <laughs> <laughs> death stand goes trance-like, raises her arms as if aiming a shotgun, and slowly brings it over to aim at Spencer. Dreams are weird, but I looked up and Cutter Jane was holding this big shotgun just a few feet away from me, and when I looked up and saw it, it was 
like our thoughts and unspoken words from running back and forth up and down the barrel of that gun. Well, I started doing this inventory of every interaction I'd ever had with Jade, and it was like she was doing the same, and we were both evaluating them up and down the barrel of that shotgun, kind of weighing the pros and cons of how we had been. And a split second into that, I remembered standing in the lunch line with Marigold, and, and how Marigold snarks up to Jane and says, Oh, Cutter, I heard about that exciting birthday party you had. Gee, two friends and a frozen pizza. I remember that day, and I remember how ill I felt to hear Mary would be so mean. It was so pointless and so mean, but I didn't do anything. I think I even smirked to make it look like I thought it was funny. And that's just Marigold. And Marigold needs to take the pump shotgun test. Beth, snap out of it. Beth drops her arms, returns to reality, and to her seat. But in my writing, I'm just saying, Maybe this is the new take on the golden rule, you know? Do unto others as you have them do unto you. I, I hope everyone who comes to my site leaves with their own sense of the shotgun test. Got it, Cutter Jane. Got it. Golden rule and pump shotguns. What could possibly go wrong? I'm just saying, look around the cafeteria, look around the classrooms, the halls, look around your life. If someone you know came to school with a shotgun in their hands, would they give you a pass? Or would they... You want everyone to live in fear. No. I want everyone to live in joy. In goodness. I want people to step out of the shadows of petty meanness and into the sunshine. You're talking about a utopia. Is that bad? You don't have to love everyone you meet. You don't have to like them. But why would you want to be mean to someone? Yes, it's ugly, but it's life. Someone like Marigold is so damn insecure, she has to put down others just to boost her sense of who she is. And of course, meanwhile, she's mangling lives. Marigold, it's not like she dropped a bucket of paint in my head, but I just kept asking myself, why? Why? Why the cruelty? I hardly know Marigold. And that frozen pizza? To my mother, who works harder than all of your parents combined, that was something special she did for me. You know, that, that was an ugly thing to do, even for Marigold. <coughs> but you don't have the answer. You want all of us to live in a state of paranoia. I want all of us to live with awareness. Awareness of who we are, and of how we treat those around us. And maybe wearing a black trench coat can be a reminder. Of the shotgun test. Have I been a big enough asshole to warrant getting blown away if some kid goes off the deep end? I think this whole mass shooting thing is going to pass. Good. I think in the future, unless we can do something to heal school culture, when some bully pushes a kid to the breaking point instead of shooting up the school, these kids are going to start tracking down those assholes outside of school. Instead of mass shootings, there might be a string of mystery homicides. <laughs> mystery until someone starts connecting the dots. <coughs> Why are all the mean girls disappearing? Or that's the third bully this week. That's the third bully this week that's ended up face down on the pavement. Can you imagine the warnings the schools would have to put out? Kind of like selective snow days. The principal sending recorded phone messages to the parents of kids like Marigold and Tom Dunn and Margaret Pierce and saying, please keep your child home from school today. Your ch child teacher has placed them on an asshole protection list. And until we find out who is killing all the bullies and mean girls, we suggest that you keep your child home from school. Well, that's one weird vision. <laughs> but, but what happens when Marigold who ha has the shotgun? Or uh, Tom or Margaret? And what then? Uh, will the mean girls panic? Will they go hunting down the people they've been mean to as a preventative measure? It would never happen. Why not? Homicide looks really bad on that precious college application. <laughs> She's got a point. <clears throat> I can see your letter to Harvard right now. Beth's be happy plan for world peace. While I really wanted to go to Africa again with mom and dad to build clean water systems for the poor unfortunates in rural Kenya, I instead put my summer, I spent my summer stalking down every geek and goth I've been rude to as an effort to kill them before they could exact revenge on me. Not funny, Spencer. Please, please, please let me in. I need to leave town in a hurry. <laughs> Postscript, if, if, if you don't let me in, I will kill you. <laughs> You're urging people to shoot everyone they think is a bully in their life. Listen to the self-righteous Spencer, all in a tizzy. 
afraid I'm, I'm parked outside with a trunk load of shotguns. Have you actually read my blog? I don't have to, just the name just says it all. And you're an honor student here? How does that fly with your teachers? I don't have to read that essay, I, I read the title. Okay. Have either of you ever been assigned to read Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal? I say assigned, because apparently neither of you ventures outside of class assignments. But I wrote a paper on it once. It was written in 1729. Tell us, Beth, just what was his modest proposal? It, it was a cookbook. He said that poor families in Ireland should sell the children they couldn't feed to the wealthy Englishmen so they could eat them. And he provided recipes. And did idiots like Spencer jump up and down with outrage that Jonathan Swift wanted to cook poor children and feed them to wealthy Englishmen? Well, perhaps idiots like Spencer did, but everyone else knew it was a satire that was actually begging the world to take better care of children. Very good, Ben. And tell me, when you read my In Praise of Black Trench Coats, did you think that my language was a bit more, a bit overwrought and old-fashioned? I thought you were just trying to see the dog. Wasted effort on my part. Cast not your pearls before swine. In this case, the pearls were my writing, in which I paralleled in tone and logic a modest proposal. In this case, the swine were the honor students such as you and Spencer, our best and brightest, who couldn't detect the satire if it fell on your foot and tripped you. <laughs> so you don't want people to take shotguns to school? I want people like Marigold and Tom Gunn and all the mean kids of the world to carry the image of a shotgun to school. I want them to carry the vision of some kid they mercilessly pick on arriving someday in a black trench coat and have them wonder if just maybe someone has pushed them, him or her, over the edge. Okay. You obviously aren't as dumb as you look, Cutter Jane. <laughs> you're, you're suggesting the use of stereotypical, terrifying images. Shotguns and black trench coats is sort of a dialectic. A conversation started to explore how and why we treat others so poorly. Dialectic? Welcome to my life. I research and write the paper, and Spencer, the slacker, just grasps the entire concept in two seconds. Some of us have to study, and Spencer just goes. Spencer, man of mystery. <laughs> Does Spencer have any idea of the cloud of mystery he casts? I don't think so. He couldn't care less what people think about him, and people know it. That's part of his mystery. Hey, if, if we've settled <clears throat> the mystery of black trench coats, uh, we can all go home. Uh, and Beth can get back to her regular scheduling, scheduled program. Spencer, you, you came to this school just two <coughs> years ago, and you already own it. And you don't do a damn thing except mope around. That letterman's jacket you never take off, it isn't even from this school. <laughs> just being frugal. What happens when rich kids move? Does your dad just call American Express Concierge Services and say, uh, we're moving from one rich enclave to another, and please let our new neighbors in the school know that our one and only child should be immediately embraced? <coughs> and do I get frequent flyer mileage points for this? <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. And that jacket, it, it doesn't even have your name on it. It's some other boys. Trevor. Trevor? Who the hell's Trevor? It's just an old jacket. An old jacket that you never take off. Is that why your parents relocated? Were you going steady with some boy out there and your parents decided they couldn't handle their only child being so different that they wanted to give you a fresh start? We're kind of off topic and we don't have much time. Do yourself a favor and shove that planner of yours and the clock. That coat of yours, Spencer, did you love Trevor? Yes. I loved Trevor. I still love Trevor. I will always love Trevor. That's just too sweet. Spencer and Trevor. Trevor and Spencer. It sounds like you were both named by the same yuppie mother. Oh, Trevor! Spencer! Get in the car! It's time for dinner! Both of you stop. That's why you're always moping around. That's why you never go out. Never ask anyone over to your two-doctor home. People might call me Cutter Jane, but no one can figure you out, Spencer. But you are rich and cute and sufficiently bright so that the mystery just adds to your persona. It's just kind of funny that the girls have been fainting over you, and I, I guess it 
It should have been the boys. I don't care about your cutting, Jane, and I don't care anything about whatever might have happened between Spencer and Trevor. Because all you care about is maintaining a perfect four-point GPA. So that maybe you might get a shot at, uh, as a valedictorian to use as another merit badge to get into Harvard. Spencer, if you want to be a slacker and waste all the talents you were given... This is good. Stop! Stop! <laughs> stop! Both of you! We're running out of time! I live with more pressure than either of you will ever know before I even make it to the breakfast table. Yes, I'm trying, and yes, I'm succeeding, but that's not why we are here. I really wish I could just toss this planner away. Just toss it away. I know people make fun of me. My life would be so easy. I'd love to be happy slackers like you, but I... You sit there with all your friends pulling out your planners and talking about how terribly busy life can get. Jane, you think I've got friends? All I've got are competitors. <laughs> we all want the same thing. Straight A's and valedictorian. First in class, president of class, Harvard, Princeton, here we come. But that means just one single B. One single B plus can blast you out of the four-point club and blast you out of the valedictorian race. So exhausting. Go ahead and laugh at me. Everyone else does, but I'll be competing against every other four-pointer in the nation who wants to get into Harvard or Princeton or Yale or Dartmouth or... The rest of you are on some damn social cruise, having the time of your life, and I'm sitting inside a pressure cooker, and you want to talk about what? Yep, that's me. Not a care in the world. Go to hell. Both of you. I'll see you there. You don't go to hell for loving another boy. So what if I killed that boy? Then what? I'm sure you broke his heart. That's what I did. I broke his heart. I'll never understand which kids. So, Spencer, the man of mystery is carrying some baggage. About 500 pounds worth. And Cutter Jane, th th there's not a damn thing you or anyone else can do to lessen that load. So, let me, let me play the role of Beth, our overbooked, multitasking, four-point student, and say, look at the clock. Back to on task. You're not carrying 500 pounds. You're just carrying that jacket, wrapping yourself in some lost love. Take it off! I don't understand. Take it off! The coat isn't the burden. Cutter Jane stands walks over to Spencer, pulls a box cutter without the blades from her trench coat and holds it to Spencer's face. Take off the coat. You'd die for this guy. I can see it. You'd die for him, this great lost love. Spencer closes his eyes and keeps them closed for at least the next minute. Cutter Jane puts the box cutter away and in disbelief walks back to her chair. And you think I'm the crazy one? Am I the only sane person in this room? Yes. You, the one with the shotgun fixation, are the only sane one. <laughs> this meeting hasn't gone according to plan. You two are letting time slip away like water down the drain. Lady, if you are so damn worried about the ticking clock, let's just call it quits right here and now. I promise I won't bring a shotgun to school. And you better take care of that basket case, Spencer. Well, my dream! We heard about your dream. I said I won't shoot you. I won't shoot anyone. I just want people to talk and catch some awareness. And just maybe... In my dream, you saved my life. You know how dreams are. They shift and they morph. You were at one end of the gun and I was looking down at you. Or our thoughts were going back and forth, zipping up and down the barrel. Nice to hear I have a heart and that I didn't shoot. But it was more than that. You were there at the gun, and then you weren't, and the gun was gone, and then something else happened. But you saved my life, and, and it didn't have anything to do with the gun. All the rest of the dream was blurred soon after I woke, but not that part about you saving my life. You saved my life. How? I don't know. You were just scared by what I wrote. Black trench coats and all that stuff? I wrote your blog today. I had my dream six days ago. The rich kids could be still whacked out. <laughs> what about him? I don't know. But in my dream, you saved my life, and it was about the shotgun. It was real, it was vivid, and you saved my life. I just don't know how. And that's why we're here. <laughs> if you're going to save her life, you better do it soon. <laughs> the way you are carving yourself up, I mean, who knows how much Spencer, longer... Spencer, you... you just shut up? Uh, no. No, I won't shut up. 
Hey, excuse me, but I have a real problem with self-destructive behavior. My, my father is a pediatric oncologist. It's translating that for Cutter Jane, it means he spends his waking hours trying to save kids with cancer. <laughs> and <laughs> every one of them would thank God for healthy blood you so joyfully stood on the floor. We're on page 20. <laughs> Simple solution, <laughs> don't do it. It's not simple, Spencer. Well, kids cut because they can't handle the pressures. Yes, cutting is not good. Most of them know it's not smart. The scars never go away. When the cuts get infected, the scars only get worse. And if the infection goes into the blood, you can get blood poisoning, sepsis, and die. Only about 20% of kids who do this are suicidal. Let me guess, you, you wrote a paper on this? <laughs> God only knows you would never be able to find time to cut yourself. Not with your planner. So tell me, Beth, why do we do it? What I wrote in my paper was that those who cut claims it provides a temporary relief from whatever pressure or sadness or other agony they might be feeling in their world. It's just a very temporary and dangerous escape from the pressures of life. Well, the escapism mirage, of, of course there is no escape, you just get another problem to deal with. And we start picking up all those gross little infection adult scars which never go away. So why don't we stop that? In researching my paper, I found that along the way it becomes a habit. Maybe like smoking, only if you stop smoking your lungs get better. Wait five years and the damaged lung cells will be gone. Five years after you stop cutting, you still got the scars. Thank you, sister. And not your sister. I hear you, Spencer. Your father treats kids with cancer? And my mom is in pediatrics, too. She spends her days treating kids who would love to be healthy. Look, Spencer, we'd all love to be healthy. Look, I'm trying to stop. So my mom got me in to see a counselor about this for 30 minutes. One 30-minute appointment. All my mom could afford. And at the end of the session, the counselor says, there isn't a damn thing she could do about it unless I want to stop. And great, I said, I want to stop. And she says, you got to want that a little bit more, honey. <laughs> and then she was gone. You should have listened to her. Spencer, you aren't exactly Mr. Perfect yourself. You're <laughs> absolutely brilliant, but you're an absolute slacker. You never study for anything. You think it's all a big joke, and then you ace your physics test. AP chemistry is a big yawn to you, and you pull an A without even trying. It's not a big deal. And then someone like me, someone without your brain, someone who hasn't been born to two doctors, has to study until midnight every day, and you make fun of me for having a planner and trying to get into Harvard. You still pull your A's. I mean, report cards came out today. You'll pull another four-pointer and check off another semester from your anxiety list. How much longer? I need that four-point average. With your SAT scores, you don't. The admissions police will just say, the poor lad was bored. Meanwhile, for me and everyone else, the classes are getting harder, and I don't feel like I'm getting any smarter, and someone like you just slides. Let, let's get back to Spencer and his perfect life. Let's look at his parents. Wow, two doctors. Where do you put all the money? You're the smartest one in the room, Cutter, at least the most per perceptive. Why haven't you figured out that two physicians in the middle of their career, careers don't just decide to relocate? They both have, they both gave up their practices. They gave up their careers. My, my parents have been, because of me and Trevor, for two years, and, and they are basically glorified temp workers, filling in for vacationing doctors. Sure, they make some money, but they are temp workers, filling in there. All because they were so ashamed of me and the way I treated Trevor that they had to leave. I ruined what Trevor had left his life, and I ruined theirs. I think you're carrying a load you don't need to carry. Words of wisdom from Cutter Jane. <laughs> but you whack away your arms, spilling that beautiful, healthy blood, and all I can think about is my brother with some horrible cancer. Spencer, you're an only child. Yes, I'm an only child. So you don't have a brother? Right. I do not have a brother. Not anymore? Not anymore. 
So your brother Trevor died of cancer? That means you didn't kill him. I know that I killed him. That's my burden. That's my backpack of rocks. That's the load I'll carry to my grave, and the sooner I get there, the better. Only um, child, not only child. Cancer death. No, it was murder. Am I the only sane person in this room? Well, right now, there's a lot of competition for that prize. <laughs> so what happened? I can't say. It's a little late for that, Spencer. I cannot well, say. You didn't kill your brother, Spencer. I did. I killed him. Well, how, Spencer? How did you kill your brother? It hurt too much. Then say it, Spencer, say it. I would absolutely love to spill my guts and explain exactly how horrible I am. But as, as Beth would say, look at the clock. I'm just about out of time. Well, what did you do, Spencer? You know what? It's your lucky day. I just realized that I do want you to know. I want everyone to know what I did. By not talking about it, I'm getting off too easy. So here's what I did. Nothing. I, I got scared. I abandoned him just like his friends did. And so I did nothing. Spencer, that's what anyone would do. Liar! Cutlass liar! I abandoned him. We all did. He was sick, and we were terrified. Sure, at first everyone was there for Trevor. Trevor, posters, balloons. You're going to beat this. But he didn't beat it. He couldn't beat it. And as his body started to shut down, and the treatments and drugs made his head balloon and his teeth rot, and as he cried in pain from it getting to his bones, it got too hard to watch. You didn't kill your brother. It's, all, it's, one of, it's one thing for his friends to abandon him, but I was his brother. I found as many things to do as I could, found as many reasons to be gone as I could, and to not be with my brother as he was dying. Maybe I thought if I didn't see him, like, maybe I thought if I didn't see him, like my miracle worker's parents would make him better. I knew they couldn't. They knew they couldn't. Trevor died of cancer. Then, just before Trevor died, I woke up. The haze cleared. I, I saw clearly what was happening, and I snapped out of it. I loved my brother. Hell, I would have gladly switched places with him. And I woke up, and I knew that I, I was going to make it all up for him. I was going to drop out of school and be with him every day. And then he died? Worse than that. I had planned a surprise party for him. I'd gone to his three best friends and told them about my fears and their fears, and I said we were going to have a party, our own, our own, part, our own party, on Saturday. And it, it, was, it wasn't going to be for half an hour. No more than that deliver balloons and make a quick, quick departure stuff. We were going to be there all day, in his room, on his bed. And then? That your planner is calling. We still got about 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right down to the minute. You can't help yourself, can you? But before that party, before that soul cleansing redemption, before you had the chance to. He died. You didn't kill him, Spencer. <clears throat> That's what my parents say. But I know that. No, you don't. I ran home from school that day to tell him about the party. It was supposed to be a surprise, but I needed to tell him. My mom was away from the house. Not for long, but she was away from the house. Oh my God. And so you... Found the body. <coughs> Found the body. Found the body! Easy to say, not so easy to do. I'm going to tell him. Try to wake him up. I put my hand on his arm, and he's cold. His face is filled with pain. He died alone. Just like I left him alone in the family. Spencer lets out a wail of pain that has been two years in the mission. Not poor Spencer. I've never asked for sympathy, and I won't accept sympathy. 
In fact, I almost got arrested. Arrested? <laughs> it's funny looking back on it, actually. The medical examiner and a squad car pull up and I keep screaming, I killed him! I killed him! And I meant it, too. And I still do. My father almost got in a fight with a cop when the guy tried to put handcuffs on me. I don't know what my dad did. I mean, he threatened to hit the cop with his stethoscope. I don't remember any of it. I heard my mom telling it all in my shrink. I guess I was carted away that day. It wasn't to jail. Well, what did your shrink say? The shrink, the shrink kept saying it was common for kids to get scared when faced with someone else's sickness. She said it was like Trevor had lost the scent of the pack. What did you say? Nothing. Never spoke a word. For how long? Three months. And you never said a word? I didn't want to make excuses. Or hear any excuses for what I'd done. You know, for an AP honor student, you're pretty dense, Spencer. <laughs> Even allowing for the fact that you're a boy, you're dense. Dense as in stupid. Dense as in blind. You're poor parents. Dances and I could give a damn. But spare me, please, but you really need to understand the simple and obvious truth that your parents didn't give up their medical practices and switch states because they were ashamed of anything. They did it for love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beth, you want to explain it to Einstein? I'm sure that you were, understandably enough, a basket case after your brother died. It sounds like you were bordering on catatonic. What Jane is saying, and I agree, is that your parents gave up everything, everything to try to save your life. They had already lost Trevor. They didn't want to lose you too. It was all for love, Spencer. There was no shame. There was no blame. They did it all for love. Spencer looks from Carter Jane to Beth and back to Carter Jane. He closes his eyes and closes them tighter and tighter. His shoulders shake. He puts his hands up to cover his eyes and cries. Carter Jane stands, walks around the table to Spencer. Beth walks over to Spencer, pulling on Spencer's right arm as if taking it from the strap of the backpack. We're laying down that dirty, Spencer. You don't need it anymore. Your brother never wanted this, and he doesn't want it now. She takes Spencer's left arm and pulls his arm through the imaginary backpack strap. You're free of that load you've been carrying. This sucker is heavy. Good God. Did Beth just say, this sucker's heavy? <laughs> That's the closest I've ever heard Beth get to swearing. Don't get me started. Well, how does it feel? It feels lighter. So much lighter. It feels good. But it's okay. We won't tell anyone about any of this. No, you've got to tell everyone about everything. Oh my god, what a diva. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I mean is, I'm never again going to be an only child. My brother is not a secret. He's my brother. My 30-minute counselor said there was no way I could stop cutting myself. Until I wanted to. Now I want to. You mean that? I mean it. Spencer takes off his letterman's jacket. So, this was my brother's. After... He died, I wore it to bed, I wore it to school. I've hardly ever taken it off since that day. Hand the jacket to Cutter Jane. Put it on. Oh, no, you keep that coat. Please, just put it on. Cutter Jane takes off her black trench coat and lays it on the table. She wears short sleeves, exposing the scars on her arms. She puts on the letterman's jacket. It has a good vibe. <laughs> Wearing it was like having my brother hug me. It was always there, always hugging. Carter Jane pulls her right arm from the jacket. No, oh, put it on. It's yours. He wants to be with you now. My brother will always be with me. I don't need that coat anymore. <coughs> he likes you. Thinks you just might have saved... Thinks you, thinks you just might have saved my life. Maybe you saved mine. She picks up her trench coat and hands it to Spencer. Spencer puts it on. <laughs> It's a good look for you, Spencer. It's a really good look. Spencer puts his hand into the trench coat pockets and then pulls out a box knife. He opens it, looking at the razor blade. You need this? 
Not anymore. And not ever again. Spencer tosses it into the metal wastebasket where it lands with a loud thud. And you don't need it either. What? Is that much time for Oh, about six minutes. <laughs> you know, an hour ago, this wouldn't have mattered to me, Beth. An hour ago, I could have given a damn what you did. But now I do care. We, we really don't have time for this. You know more about cutting than I do. I wrote a paper on it. I'm sure you didn't. And I'm sure you got an A how the facts and figures. Only 20% are actually, you know, trying to kill themselves. But look out for the blood poisoning, and those scars simply never go away, and they have a nasty habit of getting I infected. wrote a paper. I like your cardigan sweaters. I like your ruffle sleeve glasses. All very preppy. All very Nordstrom. All very Lance and, and All very long sleeved. Beth tugs her sleeves further down. I am dense, aren't I? I don't know you. I don't know you. And I do know you. I know you better than anyone else in the school does. You are a good person. And you are going to stop hurting yourself. Carter Jane pulls out her arms and Beth walks to her, buries head on her shoulder. I have lived in a pressure cooker for as long as I can remember. We always think everyone else is rolling in roses and we never see their colors. Get over here, Spencer. Spencer walks over and joins the group hug. Oh my god, was that a group hug? <laughs> Tomorrow, tell the vice principal that Cutter Jane is as crazy as ever, but that you and Spencer heroically talk me back from the edge and tell him just to be safe. You want to continue meeting here, just the three of us, every week for the rest of school. And you want some extra credit for it, too. That might be some college essay material. This can be a no pressure zone. Spencer, are you trying to win all the Hell no. Neither am I. Guess what? Neither am I. That B that Spencer was joking about finally happened today <coughs> in music. So I guess I'm not trying for it anymore either. But I would like to get together every week right here. Well, Spencer who sometimes isn't as dumb as he looks, actually had an interesting idea for you, <coughs> talking the geeks and guys, starting a conversation. Poor Harvard must think that half their applicants somewhere in East Africa for all the essays they read, so they might enjoy some stories from home. <laughs> actually, I think I can work on that. I think we can work on that. But absolutely, positively, no homicides. Agreed. I think maybe some strategic stalking, but no homicides. <laughs> Beth walks to the wastebasket and pulls out the box cover. Just one last thing to do. Beth slides open the blade. And Spencer, I want you to help me. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Remember, I'm the only sane person in the room. Will you help me? Help you do what? Spencer is no longer an only child. I am no longer wearing long sleeves. Are you sure? These scars are a part of who I am. Or who I used to be. I'm supposed to be a student leader. That's what I hear at home and at school, so I'll leave it. Cutter Jane pulls the blouse sleeve away from Beth's arm and places blade at about elbow length. Higher. Cutter Jane moves the blade up to bicep length. Higher. Cutter Jane begins cutting sleeve completely off at the shoulder seam. Stop! He picks up scissors from shelf and hands them to Cutter Jane. I know you two are old hands with razor knives, but you're <laughs> <laughs> Cutter Jane snips away on sleeve along shoulder seam. But will the young and dumb kids want to copy you? Will they think the, star the scars are cool? No way. Not when they see, and they will see the scars that I've got. Carter Jane pulls the sleeve off as Beth holds her arm palm side up. As the sleeve comes down, uncovering Beth's forearm, Carter Jane stops and shakes her head. Keep going. Carter Jane pulls the sleeve completely off. She holds Beth's arm and then kisses a long vertical scar where a vein was once split open along its length. Can you say something? Yeah. And part of that 20%. 
about that sanity contest? Can we call it a three-way draw? Carter Jane takes off the letterman's jacket and gives it to Beth. Look, 20 percenter. Take this coat, it's yours. And Spencer is right, you can feel his brother inside it. He does hug you and he's crying right now. Here, it's yours. Beth slowly pulls, puts it on as, it, as if it does carry magic. Then she tosses her letterman sweater to Jane, who laughs and puts it on. Beth walks to Spencer and pulls up the collar of his trench coat. Tongue's shell wag. Does this mean we're all going steady? Works for me. The honor is mine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so light. I feel so awake. I feel like I've been in a daze for the past two years and now I'm awake. And you're awake. Gallant ladies, my wide awake friends, are you ready to start off and do some exploration of this world? The world is so big and so inviting and so free. Are you ready? Carter Jane takes one of Spencer's arms, Beth takes the other. <coughs> we really don't need this old classroom anymore. Let's go over to my house, shall we? You'll be the first friends I've ever brought home since moving here. My parents will be ecstatic. With us? Yes, with us. Mom, Dad, I want you to meet my two very best friends. My name is Cutter Jane. <laughs> and I'm Butcher and Beth. <laughs> We're going up to Spencer's room to talk about Trevor, his way cool brother who Spencer loves fiercely and forever. Oh, we'd love some pizza. But it has to be frozen. <laughs> then off we go! Wait, wait, I have to check my planner. Carter Jane and Spencer drop arms and turn to watch Beth in disbelief. Beth returns to the table and picks up her planner. Without opening it, she holds it high, then drops it into the wastebasket with a loud thud. <laughs> I'm free. Kurt. <laughs> 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 